Hi, my name is Susan Stotterall, and I'm going to be your host for Beyond the Books, The Language of Success, an interdisciplinary podcast on child and adult literacy. Thank you for joining us. And today, my guest is Jan Burrell, who is a children's author and is um, also working with uh, towards literacy and, and handling disabilities and something like that. So Jan, if you can tell me, um, tell me how you, you said you were an interim teacher and what grades did you teach? Hi, Susan. I taught grades seven through 12. Whatever teacher was absent for some sort of a reason for a long period of time, or if it was in between teachers, I would go and take care of the class. I've done agriculture, chemistry, biology, social studies, English, and special ed. So well, I do the game. Well-rounded. Well <laughs> you can teach about anything. Yeah. Um, yes. And uh, what did you get your, did you get your degree in just uh, childhood education or what? And, and where do you live? Honestly, I got it in agricultural education. Wow. And I live, yeah, I live in Northern New York, right on the Canadian border, 45 miles from Montreal. Now, um, I met you on LinkedIn, I believe. And uh, you were talking about being disabled because you had a stroke. And we started talking about the fact that uh, you had to relearn everything as if you were a baby, pretty much, or a small child anyway. So can you tell me about uh, I did. Yes. What, ex what, a, what a, exactly what was your diagnosis? How was it taken care of? Uh, I believe that you told me once that you were told that there wasn't anything they could do. And yet somehow you managed to get to where you are now and be sitting here and talking to me just fine. Uh, so tell me a little bit Thank about you. that. I had this stroke eight years ago in the end of July. I knew I was having it, so I was able to call my partner at the time, my son, and 911. But by the time I dialed 911, I couldn't speak anymore. I could just make noises. So they got an ambulance to me as fast as possible, took me to the hospital where they waited for the... <laughs> This is kind of funny because I love helicopter rides, but we had a helicopter come to take me to Burlington, Vermont, and I didn't remember any of it. I lost three <laughs> days, and that included my ride. Go figure. Wow. But, um, you, yeah. You tell me they have to take you up again since you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, but in Burlington, they were going to do... Uh, brain drain because I had a hemorrhagic stroke, which meant that my brain was bleeding. I have very delicate veins that break easily. And I was under a lot of stress with our farm. Mm. So my, my brain popped, basically. Wow. Does, yeah. having, does having very sensitive veins like that uh, give you a higher risk? Yes. Oh, I didn't know yes. that. Hmm. Uh, well, that's something that some people should be aware of if they do. Or I don't know. Is that common knowledge? or Not really, but I had had an operation on my feet when I was in high school. And going in, the doctor just nicked a little. I didn't even nick it, actually. And all the blood vessels in my feet around where he was working broke. And he told me that I was going to have to be careful of my blood pressure because an elevated blood pressure could break them very easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, and of course that would make sense because high blood pressure is often a cause of strokes. Yes, so, it is. That's right. right. Uh, I think Burlington, Vermont is a sort of a big medical center, isn't it? It is. And they were absolutely wonderful. Uh, my daughter flew in from Colorado and she stayed with me for four days. Uh, after three days, I was moved to the rehab center where I stayed for six weeks. They got me kind of walking, 
but my speech, I had aphasia very badly. So my speech was very, very slow. And my association, you would laugh at this too. They would show me a picture, say a picture of, of a banana. I would know it's a banana, but what I would say was tree. So did there, did there come a point um, where you felt like that if you were going to get well, that you were going to have to take matters into your own hands? Yes, completely. Because at that point, I knew I couldn't read because my friends had brought me books and I couldn't figure out what a sentence, what it was saying, what it meant, because I would forget the beginning by the end of the sentence. Mm. So I could look at pictures. And I had a physical therapist that came and a person to help me with my speech when I got out of the rehab, but I still was having problems with association. So with the doctor saying all my prime real estate was gone and all I had left, I figured was a swampland and a desert. Well, that's I kind. started. <laughs> yeah. Well, I started taking, <laughs> I started taking my swampland and mixing it with the desert. And little by little, I'm making fertile ground. I started with children's picture books. And I would look at the pictures and look at the word that was associated with it until they started making sense. The funny thing was I could type on the computer or on the my phone to talk to people. And, and that's the sentences, probably because that was used a different part of your brain that wasn't in, injured. Yep. And a different pathway, too. So yeah. I was able to do that, but I couldn't tell what I was writing, but I knew what I was writing. It was strange. But... I kept working with children's books and moving myself up a little bit at a time. And I went back to work after a year, I went back to school to work as a substitute teacher. And again, an interim teacher. And the kids were amazing because I could not read at that point. And they saw themselves in me struggling to look like I knew what I was doing when I couldn't tell what the teacher had written in the notes. So they started writing the daily assignments on the board. And when they were reading in class, they didn't read silently. They read aloud so that I could follow along. And they helped me to learn how to read again. They pushed me to talk. So my aphasia started becoming uh, something that was from the past, which is nice to be able to say. And they were my inspiration because they pushed me, and I needed that. And these were spe were these special ed kids, or they were all the kids, especially oh. believe it or not, the worst kids that the teachers would tell me, "Watch out for them," or "This one's not going to make it, so don't worry about him." And I worried, and I worked with all the kids, so they were all wonderful. I don't nope. think I had one kid give me a hard time. Uh, that is something no teacher should ever say, is don't bother with this kid. Until exactly. you walk a mile in their shoes. Kids don't act up because they're just doing it. You know what I mean? Yes, they're doing it out of frustration for some reason. Yeah, and a lot of times it's they really are, I mean, they are not as bad as where you were in literacy and all that. But they're not, they understand that because they struggle with words every day, 15 times a day. And finally, they just go, yeah, this isn't worth it. And unfortunately, um, <laughs> it is worth it. And the way education is being treated right now is really not good because if you are illiterate, you know, say you read at a fourth grade level if you're lucky you all have almost no hope of maintaining a decent existence. When I was working with the special ed kids as their teacher for four months, I was very concerned about them because it was the senior high kids, about them going out into the workforce, which was where they were headed. So for reading, believe it or not, believe it or not comic books, got them interested. 
Superman, Spider Man, they started reading and they liked to read and, them. And, and they can be actually those those comic books and the anime books can be fairly sophisticated in language. They don't have, you know. And I've heard, uh, I was in the bank and one of the the one of the tellers was a former teacher. Probably she became a teller because she wasn't getting paid enough as a teacher in North Carolina, which is notoriously low. Um, and she was real, her daughter was seven or eight and uh, was a big reader, but she got drawn into the comic books and her mother was worried about her, you know, that she was going to just jump into, because it's quick, you know, you're not teaching yourself, uh, you know, to read 80 chapter books. No, and but it still I, gives I, you the interest. Yeah. Well, that's the first step. And then work to stretch that out. Um, but I mean, I, that's one of the things I worry about in literacy is this, you know, like you can't even make a full length video anymore. It's gotta be a real, you know, it's gotta be instant. You know, I can watch it. For and sure. I was in a, a yeah. book, I was in a book, um, oh, what, like a seminar for all on all different aspects of self-publishing and for indie authors. And there was one girl that was sitting there and she says, I don't know how anybody sits through a two hour movie. And, you know, she was youngish. And well, I thought, if you have ADHD, I can see it as well. It's hard for them if they don't have their hands moving yeah. to stay focused. I don't think she was, though. She was a writer. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she didn't seem hyper. It's just that she was used to everything working fast, you know. No, yeah. Did your book come out yet? Yes, it did. Put it, put it back a little bit. Put it towards you a little bit. Purple. It's hard to see in the. Oh, Tuppy's new friend. Tippy's new friend. Yes, Tippy, oh. come here. Oh, Tippy. Okay, it's hard Tippy. to see. It's it's hard to see in the screen. It's, it blurs. It's it. shiny. Yeah. yeah. Come here. Let me introduce you to. Come here. Come here. Tippy. Come on. Come on. Come on. Tippy. All right. Yeah. That is a big dog. Yes, she is. And she is a star of the book. <laughs> oh, Tippy's cool. new friend. Oh, and who's her new friend? Her new friend is a white dragon. Oh, cool. Yeah. And when they get to be friends, they go on flights all over the place. And my book is fun to read. The pictures are awesome. I didn't do them. My publisher came up with a... Um, illustrationist, but children will enjoy reading them because they're fun. But while they're reading them, they learn about different states. They learn about different countries. They learn where they are, how we got there. So I've created a learning series. It will be a whole series. The next book is coming out next year. It's Tippy Goes to California. Oh, cool. Yeah, and it'll be about all the states, and, and it's so many kids know their state. They know a few other states, but not where they are or how they would get there or anything like that. So I hope to bring the country, our country, and other countries right to their there are, hands. There are, several, there are several authors that have done that. My books are all set in New York City, which most people really don't know very much about either. That's true. You know, very true. They also are not riding in cars that much. You know, they have to take a bus. They have to take a train. So you're going around among people that are very different from you. Very true. And I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm I mean, I grew up in Western Kansas, but, you know, my uh, milieu was so small and tiny, you know. The idea of doing something like that was just, you know, if you wanted to go somewhere, you either rode your bike if you were old enough or you got in the parent car and your parents took you, you know, you, that was it. I think it is there your your book is just a fantasy book. Is that correct? It's, it's not to do with disabilities of, of any kind? It's, it does state in the beginning that Lana, who is a history teacher in junior high, had a stroke, which is why Tippy is with her now. 
Oh, okay. I am going to be bringing more and more of that out. In fact, some states, we are making special rider seats for Saren because we'll be picking up handicapped children as well. Oh, cool. cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I'm glad that we got to talk today. Um, if there was something that you wanted to say about literacy in the public schools, and particularly as not being a full-time, you know, the only teacher, you're always subbing for somebody or replacing someone for an amount of time. Uh, what, what would be your reflection upon that? We have a long way to go to make sure that all children can read and write comfortably. Agreed. Because a lot of them don't. Yes, and that one of the reasons I started this podcast uh, is because I was aware of that. And the only thing that allowed me to be from Western Kansas and go into opera was because of my literacy. And also through, that, I, also through that, I understood that because I went to a state school for undergraduate instead of a conservatory, the education process was not as rigorous. So when I did go to a conservatory, I had to do remedial work, like 18 hours worth of remedial work, with, in addition to a full master's program. And that was because like they had sight singing and ear training two days a week for two years in the state school. And in uh, Peabody Conservatory, or Peabody Institute as it's called now, uh, you went five days a week for four years. For oh, wow. There was a little bit of disparity, <laughs> you know. And I was also told, which is another thing that is, is really not good, is, well, if you're going to teach music in school and not go on the stage, you don't really need to know any languages. So when I got to Peabody, everybody had had uh, let's see, four years of two languages and one other language for three. Again. In our in our voice classes in high school, we had to sing Italian and Latin, and we did a little bit of French and Spanish, wow. but most of it was Latin. Yeah. Cool. Well, but, that, that was not the case in Western Kansas. <laughs> I but think my we, literacy... My what? literacy took me four years to be able to finally read Christopher Paolini's Aragon series, one book from it. And I did it. And then I got laid off in 221 or 2021. And my daughter, she said, Mom, go back to college. So I went back to college. I got my master's degree in creative writing and poetry. And I graduated summa cum laude with a 3.91. Very good. And this, this from somebody that the doctors didn't have any faith in and thought I would pretty much be a couch potato. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, that's like when I see your posts on LinkedIn and stuff, uh, it's always about keeping yourself inspired. And I think that's so important because... The majority of people are, get beaten down by whatever, either, you know, lack of money, lack of education, bad things happen to them. And it's so hard to go ahead and believe in the positive and that you can come overcome that. And that is what literacy does for people, I believe. I agree. It takes us away to another place so that we can forget about our daily woes and just be in the moment. Maybe we'll chat again. It'll be fun when we get a little bit further down the road and see how things are going and what we've learned. Sounds good. Sounds All right. good. All right. Well, thank you. And You're welcome, Susan. Thank you for having me. Okay. I'll see you again sometime. Well, I'll see you on LinkedIn or whatnot. But anyways, good to have you. And I'm really glad you could come talk with me.